in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, this morning, so we're not going to take an offering this morning. Um, and Brandon, though, but you got to give something to us. All right. Um, that's just awesome. So, tonight, our younger people, do you guys know what this is? A mug. Coffee it cup. is a Star Wars cup. <laughs> yeah, it's a coffee mug. How many of you see your parents drink coffee in the morning? Every morning. Every morning. <laughs> All day. Jeez. Kid is Well, why is well, let me ask this question. Why do your parents drink coffee? Yeah, they do. Because it gives you energy in the morning. It gives them energy in the morning. Would you say it's maybe the first thing they do in the morning? Yeah. Yeah. No. So I'm waiting to hear what you're going to say. I'm kind of scared. You're waking up <laughs> That is correct. Right. And the second thing is they walk down the stairs. There you go. So, it's coffee mugs. Are, it's a signifier thing of the first thing that a lot of people do in the morning is they make their coffee. But for you guys, uh, hopefully you're not drinking coffee. Right? I've had coffee. You've had coffee? <laughs> you drink coffee? Wow. There you go. Um, so with that, the first thing a lot of people do in the morning is drink their coffee. And while it's not bad to drink coffee, the first thing we should make in our morning is opening up scripture and spending time with God. It helps us center our day, and it gives us a different type of energy base to be able to go throughout our day as we trust in Him. So that is our signifier with our coffee mug. With that, I'm <laughs> Hey, uh, my kiddos, is it a good thing if I drink coffee in the morning? Oh, yeah. Hear that answer? Is that a yes or a no? Yeah. It's an even better thing. Sometimes if I drink coffee in the afternoon. All day. Sometimes you have a little pick me up. A little pick me up and we'll save them. That's what that is. So I titled the sermon this week kind of similar to last week because these two passages uh, very much tie together. Last week is a correct view of suffering, and this week I titled this, Why We Can Suffer. So, like I said, last week we looked at the preceding verses of our text. We talked about a correct view of suffering, and, and the thing is we all will suffer at some point. It's just, it's, it's life. To some degree, it's just suffering is part, part of life. And suffering, uh, we all suffer at different varying degrees of suffering. Some of it's a lot, some of it's just a little bit. Some of it is very acute, if you will, for a short period of time. Some of it's for a long period of time. And maybe when we talk about suffering, maybe it invites questions kind of like some of, some of these. Where does suffering even come from? And the answer is suffering comes from original sin. It comes from evil in the world. Now, it could be more than that, but if you want to get down to the very basics, very foundational piece, suffering comes from original sin. And another question, maybe is, is, is suffering an effect of my own personal sin? It can be, but not necessarily. Right? Look at the story of Job. His suffering wasn't necessarily his personal sin. It was a result of Satan wanting to test trying to disprove, if you will, God. Then you can look at the story of Achan in Joshua chapter 7, right? If you guys remember that story, Achan stole. And who suffered because of Achan's sin? His whole entire family. They all paid because of him. And we can look at our world and we can see that the atrocities that are committed by other people or another person towards another person, so... That person commits some kind of atrocity towards another person, and that person has to suffer because of the other person's sin. So is my suffering an effect always of my personal sin? No, it's not. And the clearest picture I think we can look at, actually, of somebody's sin 
of, of sin and, uh, and suffering and affected it. And it's not always personal sin that caused suffering. You look at the life of Jesus. Jesus didn't sin, period. He was perfect. And yet he suffered greatly for all of our sin. Another question could be, uh, in some suffer, is some suffer, suffering natural? In other words, like sickness, cancer, those kinds of things. And the answer is yeah. But again, result of original sin. When mankind invited sin into the world, and uh, there was a great effect that happened upon the world, right? Part of that effect was the breakdown of the human body. We're perishing every day. And it even had an effect upon the world around. Man worked before sin, tainted everything. I don't know if everybody realized that we always talk about part of the fall of, of you know, the effect of sin is we have to work now. No, they worked before that. But the difference is now work is tainted in a different way. Because when mankind disobeyed God and invited sin in, work became tiresome. Now there's failure. Now work is not efficient anymore. It became an actual work, an act of toiling. And now there's struggles and failures in, in work, in working. Animals are now afraid of man. There would sometimes even be attack of animals upon mankind. There are many natural causes of suffering in the world, and some can be direct results of someone else's uh, sin, but another one where it's a kind of natural cause, someone else, it's not you, it's somebody's cause of somebody else. And, I, and the reason why I put that under natural is it's because that's, it's just part of the way of the world. Is some suffering spiritual? And I say, yeah. Some, spirit, some suffering that we go through is, is definitely spiritual. Yeah. Meaning this. Because a person's Sins, our own personal sins can lead to suffering. Addictions would be a good picture of that, right? Overworking can be a picture of that. Your body gets so tired and stressed. Those kinds of things can have an impact upon your body. Holding on to issues of pain. If we're holding on to issues of anger, that's an issue sometimes, and different issues and different ailments upon a person, and that caused that person to work up something evil, but they're suffering because they've done something that was loving. So, and really, kind of how we can suffer, how we can make it through it. So, chapter 3, 18 to 22. Um, Hopefully this will all stay where it's supposed to, be to stay here. First, it says, this says, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and he preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when, when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from the body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in a place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities, and powers, except his authority. And a, a, real quick, as a side note to this passage, it's one of those past. again, scholars have not, they can't, it, so that we can live lives that Christ has called us to. So my question text, I think we're given five reasons, maybe more, but I think there's five reasons we're given. Five things of encouragement of why you and I, we can suffer. The first one, Jesus Christ himself is to God. The, script, the passage is very clear in there. The third thing is, Jesus is resurrected. 
that's important. The fourth thing is baptism is a reminder and it's a testimony of what Christ has done for us and in us. And then the, the fifth one is, is Jesus has the authority. He has the power to do what he says. That's where he, he was tempted for the temptation. You understand? He's in somebody doing something wrong. Jesus. 21. Jesus and drop the dead caused by sin in this world. Jesus suffered. Wrong. Christ for Christ suffered for our sins. Would really say it more to suffer for doing good on the four people. Me needing saving. That's why I went across this way. Suffered. Could I love someone else enough to suffer for them? And the answer when we experience God's love is I and, and we've set Christ apart in our hearts and know the possibilities of what that means for the future of others and know the possibility of what that means for the future of us. The answer is yeah, I can suffer for doing good because because Jesus did it, and he promises to be right there with me when I go through it. We can suffer because of the encouragement of Jesus, his suffering, and be. Hebrews 9, but died once, system, animals, by the way, that point of view of our sin is what separated us from God. And I'm not, you know, church is not, and the, and the same as when you go to the West. The picture here is, is that God, for all, for the person who knows Jesus and Jesus knows them, there's a security in our salvation and we'll snatch them. I'm going to read that again. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. For my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. It's pretty powerful. Paul, in Romans 8, 31 to 39, he asks two questions. In the beginning there, he says, Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? Who then will condemn us? And the context is Paul's talking about those who have come to Christ. And Paul answers those two questions with this. He says, no one, for God himself has, no one, no one can accuse us. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. And then he says, no one can condemn us. For Christ Jesus died for us, and he was raised to life before us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. He's the intercessor. He's the one. He's our mediator. And later in that same passage, Paul says this, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus. Amen. Pretty powerful. There is no power great enough to snatch us out of God's hand to take back what God has given or to undo what God has started. Peter in chapter 1, 3 of 5 points also to our assurance. He said this, he said, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance. And catch this next phrase. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, 
beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you re receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed to you on this last day, on the last day for all to see. There's great encouragement to know that even in our sufferings, maybe even sufferings that harm our body or take our physical life even, nothing can take back our eternal life. Amen. Because that inheritance kept for you in heaven. That makes it possible to walk through suffering. Jesus' reaction also encourages us and testifies that this suffering is not the end. But Jesus' resurrection. Paul asked the question in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? There were some in that day who thought, once you die, that's it. But Paul wants us to understand that there's something greater to come. These physical bodies that we live in, this fleshly tent, as uh, some translations say, this is just temporary. Paul said, why should we, why should we risk our lives for the gospel of the truth? That's a good question. If, if, if when you die, it's just it, or if you go to heaven no matter what, or if you just die, why should we risk our lives, he says, for this gospel, for this truth? Because if the dead are not raised, what is the point of all this? So Paul goes on to tell us that there's something more. He said Jesus died but was resurrected, and Jesus, and just as Jesus has a glorified body, those who know Christ as Lord and Savior will also have a glorified body. He said the glory of the heavenly bodies, it's different than the glory of the earthly body. And then Paul goes on and says later, he says, what I'm saying is this, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies, they cannot inherit what's going to last forever because they're not built forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret, he says. We will not all die, but, but we are going to all be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. You and I, we can walk through suffering because we know that our salvation is secure. And when Jesus said he's going to prepare a place for us, it's not to further on this broken life. There's something, there's something more, something greater. Because there's an eternal life. An eternal life that's perfect. It's different. It's better. And is transformed into glory that has no brokenness for the believer. So the question, how does, how does, uh, how does baptism fit into this? Where's the encouragement there? Why, why did Peter seem to kind of all of a sudden go from one and then jump into baptism? When Peter wrote to these Christians that were beginning to suffer for their faith at that time, baptism was, it was something for them that was more than just what they did to show, just show a response to Jesus. There's something greater for them going on. Because for them, it was a commitment. It was a life commitment. It was a commitment that said, this may be, this may be the last decision I ever make. Because of the persecution that they would face. Because of what it meant within their families sometimes. It was a choice that they understood would put them into a place of possibly suffering for Jesus on a huge level. But in their hearts and their minds, it was absolutely worth it to be baptized. Because they would be baptized. I don't know if you guys knew that, but they were being baptized after Jesus' death on the cross. People were being baptized. And sometimes they would do it in, in, in public places. Sometimes it wasn't quite as public, but there was usually people that found out about it. There were people that were watching it. And when they would get baptized in front of people that may have been their enemy. The word may have got back, hey, so-and-so has committed allegiance to Christ. They're no longer saying that they're committed to the allegiance of Rome. So now it's treason. They knew what that meant. Noah in his day, Noah in his day was different than those of his time. Imagine for a moment 
there had never been a great flood. Right? If you were if if you were in that time period, you would not know a flood. You would not know rain. There had never been an event that challenged the life on the planet like what was coming that Noah himself knew about. Listen to 2 Peter 2, 5 to 6. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. During Noah's day, evil was rampant. It was on a level like we don't, I don't think we've seen again. Genesis 6, 5 says, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And that phrase actually means the extent to the extreme. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Wow. So Peter was giving them a picture of God's judgment when he talked about baptism. They understood this. But he also gave them a picture of a saving act. The rainbow is a symbol of a new covenant with God, what God was going to do, that he would never destroy the earth by flood again. And baptism is a symbol of the new covenant that came through what Jesus did on the cross for us and his resurrection. The water was a symbol of judgment, that sin would be dealt with, and it was a picture of salvation and deliverance from mockery of sin. Because remember, the ark, Noah and his family went up to the ark, and the ark raised above the waters, came above. The, the water did not have ability to take them out, to judge them necessarily. <laughs> Noah was saved from judgment, and he was ushered into a new life. It was, it was a different life after the flood. Baptism is a symbol that identifies with us identifies us with Jesus and what he did for us, separating us from, from the lost people that don't know him and giving us new life. And I do want to mention this, that Peter gives a qualifying statement here because this can be confusing. When he says uh, in, in verse 21, some translations will say it like this, the water saves you. What it is not saying is that baptism is where sal salvation comes because of baptism. Because Peter gives, he makes some qualifying statements in his passage. He says this, he says, as a response to God from a clean conscience. There are two things going on here. The first, Jesus has cleansed our conscience. We know that guilt has been dealt with, and now, that, and now we're citizens of heaven. We came to know Christ. The sins were done, dealt with once and for all. Now you have a clear conscience. The conscience is clear. clear You're now righteous. You've been called righteous. You have a, a cleansed conscience. We know that our shame and guilt was dealt with on the cross. And that we now are citizens of heaven. Not citizens of, of this world anymore. Citizens of heaven. Peter told us, or Paul told us that in Ephesians and Philippians and a few different others of his writings. We're clean, but when he says that it's as the response causes is the, the, the people of God to get rid of all there that's specified, to get rid of all evil behavior. We're to, when we repent, we're to run away from sin towards God. He calls, he, he, uh, and, and we're also called to live as people who've been called out of darkness into the light. So for the people reading what Peter wrote about baptism and all of that, they would understand the encouragement of what baptism meant for them in suffering. Because baptism was a public act, it was an outward action of what Jesus had done and what he was doing on the inside of them. It was a public act, and it was an encouragement, and it was a symbol of the testimony, also of saying, I believe that he is with us. It was also a, a public testimony and encouragement. It was, it was them saying that, I believe that what he will do for me, that what he promised, he's going to do for me in the future, too. 
But it was also an encouragement because it was not just an act for themselves. It was also an act for the people around them that said, I trust my life to Christ. He is the one I'm giving all my allegiance to. He is the authority in my life now. Because I have taken up my cross and I want to follow him. It was saying when they got baptized, it was saying that I'm part of the same family of God that you guys are. You, you're going to be a, a, a support for me. I'm going to be a support for you. You're going to walk alongside me. I'm going to walk alongside you in this journey of faith. I'm going to encourage you in it. They understood this very clearly, and that's why I think Peter brings up the baptism because of what it symbolizes, what it testifies for them, and what it testifies to everybody else. So it would encourage them. Lastly, you and I, we can suffer because Jesus is the one who's seated in the place of honor next to God. And all the angels and all the authorities, all the powers of this world accept his authority. That's a pretty powerful statement. That kind of, I think, is the statement that kind of closes the rest of this off for us. Because if he's the one who sits at the right hand of God, then all of what he did, all of what he promised, all of what he said is truth. It has Amen. weight to it. There's power behind it. There's authority behind it to the point where he will see it to fruition. When, in, in scripture, when it talks about somebody sitting at the right hand, it meant a person of authority. It meant a person who has prestige, a person of honor. It meant a person who actually had ruling power. And it meant a person who could go in the, in the name of the person on their left. They can go in that person's name and the things that they speak, it would be as if that person spoke. Really, they were going as that person. So when Jesus sits at the right hand of God, when he has the authority, the power, when it says, now Christ has gone to heaven, he is seated in the place of honor next to God, the right hand, they could take that and say, look, my Jesus is greater than all of this. The things that he talks about and he says, the fact that he suffered and that he was resurrected, the fact that he said that I'm going to prepare a place for you, the fact that he said I'm I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to walk alongside you. You can cast your care upon me even. I'm going to intercede for you. There's no sin. Even if the enemy of God comes to condemn you and tries to bring back that sin in your life, that thing that, that maybe you feel dirty from, that you've been washed clean of, when the enemy of God comes back in and does all, when, and Jesus said, no, I already dealt with that. You're free from that. Then we can boldly and clearly and confidently say, Get out of here, Satan. You have no right here. I'm a child of God. I'm no longer what that was. I'm clean. God now sees me as righteous. I am his child. I have a place in heaven. This is no longer my home. This this right here, this is temporary. You can do what you want, but <laughs> this is not the end for me, buddy. <laughs> I get to go on to something greater. I get to go to a place where there's no shame, no guilt. There's no crying. There's no sadness. There's no sorrow. I get to be a God. The people in Peter's time, when he wrote that, that's what they understood, I believe. And that's why they could suffer as they did. That's why the people throughout this world, when they have to stand for Christ, they can suffer. Because they, they, they get what Jesus did for them. Jesus suffered for my sins. I'm never going to suffer to the extreme that Jesus suffered. My sin... Put him on the cross. He suffered the eternity of my sin. He suffered the weight of my sin. He was punished for my sin. I can't bear that. I don't have enough in my good bank account, whatever you want to call it. I don't have enough in that account to pay for my wrong. And that's the cool part. Jesus goes to And they get this. And because of that, and because of the reward Peter talks about, and because of the reward that they see in it, it's worth it. I can suffer in this world. I can I can do good and I can suffer for doing good. It really is not that bad. And when we start to do that and when we take what I talked about last week 
that having a correct view of suffering and a correct view is setting Christ apart in our hearts, apart in our hearts to where he is the reason we are living and he is our purpose. It makes it totally possible. It makes it totally doable to suffer. It makes it possible that, I mean, I don't know if you guys have heard people when they talk about, you know, my body is hurting really bad and, and they start praying and they just, they feel, they don't hurt as much. That's because their mind gets fixed off of what is of this world and they get fixed on what Christ. All those different things. So can we suffer? I think we can. Thankfully in our country, we don't suffer like people in other countries. I was reading something, uh, I think it was last week, and it was talking about some younger people in another country that chose to say, no, I, I trust Christ. He is my forgiveness. He is my salvation. He is my allegiance. He is the one I'm going to follow. And they lost their life because of it. Pretty powerful stuff. God's word gives us strength to be able to walk through the suffering too. Let me pray, and then uh, uh, what we're going to do is give us about five minutes. Those of you guys that need are going to change to be baptized, um, go ahead and go change. But what we'll do is we'll meet down over, I think it's right over there where that cone is, I believe. It's farther down? Oh, Marsha will lead us to where it is. <laughs> I think I remember once I get over there, but I'm going to be changing too. What's that? It's like the next one. Oh, it's the next one now? Okay. So if you want to meet us over there, there, some of you, if you can walk down the pathway, you can get down there. It's steep, and there's, but there was a um, handhold on the way down at one point. If you cannot, if you stand up at the top, you can also see down there. But what we'll do is when we get over there, I've asked those that are being baptized just to give a 30-second um, testimony of their salvation. Uh, and then we will go down and then we will baptize you. All right, let's pray and then uh, we, will, we will go do that. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you, Jesus, that we have your spirit in us to give us the strength as we rely upon you, as we trust in you, to give us the strength to go in places that we, don't, we didn't think we could because of suffering. Lord, may we be encouraged to do good, even if it means that we're going to suffer. Even if it means we lose something. Even if it means it becomes hard for us for a while. But Lord, may we understand there is encouragement because of the fact that you suffered for us. There is truth in the fact that you suffered for us and you made a way for us. You were resurrected. And because that it, you've, you've already prepared a place for us. You've gone before us. And you're going to glorify us on that day. So we praise you, Lord, for that. May we be an encouragement to one another when we see a brother or sister in need struggling, trying to do the right thing, but they're, they're, they're struggling through it. God, may we be an encouragement to them. I thank you, Jesus, for, for dying for us, for saying, you know what, it, I, I want these people to have a right relationship with God.